Ural Vagon Zavod Corporation presents a film by Dmitry Rogozin. Since the day of commissioning, this factory has built over a million coaches. This country wouldn't have won World War II without them, or wouldn't have restored the economy after it, or wouldn't have turned into a superpower. This is Ural Vagon Zavod, the world's biggest builder of railway coaches. And why, we may ask, standing on a pedestal in front of its main gate is a tank, not a coach. Tanks, spirit of the Euros. Defense industry has always been the drive engine of the entire manufacturing sector. This is true not only for Russia, but for the rest of the world as well. The history of Ural Wagon Zavod offers a bright instance of a single factory that has managed to pull a country's whole tank building industry out of the quagmire. This was achieved by people, not walls or machine tools, but people who embodied the spirit of the Euros. Designers, engineers and workers. Film 2 Apart from Russia, there are only a few countries capable of designing the structure of a main battle tank and streamlining its batch production. This presupposes a cycle stretching from the output of ore to the finished products. The manufacturing of this tank is a really complicated process. The design and development of up-to-date tanks is a complicated procedure and a not a task. And it contains an element of competition in it. We must be half a step ahead of other our competitors, all the time. At least a bit ahead of them. We offer a better price, quality and reliability. We are occupying more than 50% of the world market. However this might sound, but Ural Vagon Zavod is the pride of the whole country, not only of the city of Nizhny Tagil. One tank in two sold across the world today is a combat vehicle built by Ural Vagon Zavod. Tanks from the Urals are engaged in practically any big conflict today. Still war is war. A formidable tank becomes defenseless when attacked from several sides at a time. This is especially true of combat actions in city districts. If you recall Chechnya, the tank crew suffered main losses there from the militants armed with grenade launchers and anti-tank missiles. Ural Vagon Zavod has developed a vehicle able to help tanks in the battlefield and rescuing the crew members' lives. It was named the Terminator. This is a combat vehicle for supporting tanks, which can simultaneously knock out infantrymen, armored cars, helicopters and low-flying planes. It is fitted out with two automatic cannons, a machine gun, anti-tank missiles and automatic grenade launchers. These factors enable it to create a real storm of fire. In essence, this is a multi-role vehicle, and it does not have analogs today. It gives an opportunity to resolve a wide scope of tasks, beginning with immediate support to tanks in the battlefield and fire support to infantry units during anti-terrorist operations, for instance. In my opinion, it's just indispensable. I mean the vehicles in this family. It can assure, for instance, the passage of a special assignment unit. In 
We think this vehicle can replace up to two rifle infantry squad sections. The vehicle is a well protected and maneuverable as a tank. This means its crew is protected in a reliable manner. We're looking at the foreign markets, at the things invented abroad today. As we are monitoring this, we realize there will be no chance to catch up with others if we lack even an inch behind them. That's why we have to be an advance guard of R&D of all kinds. The first reports of this combat vehicle were made quite recently, in 2011. This is the T-90MS tank, codenamed Prairif, the Breakthrough. This, of course, is a transitional vehicle, marking a transition from the fourth to the fifth generation. This vehicle will be a hundred percent helpful in maintaining the parity of combat capability of any state for at least 10 to 15 years to come. A big reserve of durability, or, as the specialists say, the modernization resource of the Nizhny Tagil tanks makes it possible to apply a modular principle of designing. For instance, the tank's combat compartment may be one of these modules. Here is the module as such, a combat module, the turret or basket as it's called. It houses the tank's crew and equipment. This is a combined complex. It can work like Lego, taken off one vehicle and mounted on another. This module can be installed on any tank built in Nizhny Tagil, including the legendary T-72. Then the time-tested vehicle transforms into a fundamentally new tank. I've never seen situations where the turret could be easily taken off a Leopard or an Abrams and mounted on a different vehicle. The turret has a big mass, and the tank's supporting capacity may prove to be insufficient for sustaining it. A display of defense technologies was held in Nizhny Tagil in September 2013 behind closed doors. The Russian leadership could see there the latest product, the heavy-duty Armata Transformer. This is a classified product, and we cannot show it to you now. Armata is a highly confidential development product of Russian designers. Owing to my official position, I certainly know what we are talking about. I myself got into the turret of that tank, which is now passing government tests. That's why you can believe me, Armata signals a grand breakthrough in tank engineering. No one else has a tank of this kind today, neither the Americans nor the Europeans. This is a true combat vehicle of the 21st century. It will be showcased for the first time in 2015 at the Victory Day Parade on Red Square. Armata is one of the symbols of resurrection of our defense manufacturing. But this new tank and the entire Russian tank engineering might have been non-existent today. When we recall the years in which the great power was receding into history, we have a lingering feeling all of this was happening on the silver screen. As if it was not us, but rather some outsiders who were hectically destroying the country that we had felt proud of. And so what happened to us then? The situation worsened further in the outrageous 1990s, when the government buried the defense industry in oblivion. In a big measure, this was caused by the prevalent ideology, which claimed Russia did not have enemies and hence it was totally senseless to arm oneself. And if we need something one day, we'll buy it abroad. 
The then Prime Minister Igor Gaidar said, let's invite the US media and cut the tank assembly lines to pieces in their presence. This will show them how peaceful we are. These reformists would say shamelessly, defense industry was a hurdle for everything. That was sheer stupidity, but it brought about the demise of many factories. We must be honest about it, but in the 1990s attempts were made by the people at the helm in Moscow simply to club this factory to death. The Defense Ministry did not give us any subsidies and did not place orders. We didn't have contracts for new R&D works that would simply keep us busy. We had a wilderness here. Lifeless workshops without light or heating, no people, everything at a standstill. When Uralwagon Zavod began to wrap up production, dozens of other factories followed in its footsteps. Vladimir Putin said once quite justly the disintegration of the USSR was the largest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. But for the defense industry, this disaster was fraught with full extinction, as it was linked by a myriad of links with factories located in all Soviet republics. Now these connecting links were breaking up. Plant number 9 in Yekaterinburg, one of the main suppliers for Ural Zavod. Cannons manufactured here were installed on all the post-war tanks built in Nizhny Tagil. There can be no tank without cannons. But the artillery plant almost went bankrupt in the early 1990s. Delays in the wage payments reached 12 months here. We continued working but did not get our money. Everyone subsisted as best as they could. Sometimes the factory fell under sanctions and power was cut off. As heating was out of operation, it was extremely cold in the workshop during the winter, and people had to invent ways of warming up, for instance, by putting on muffles and felt boots. Our designers and workers thought out various methods of thermal insulation. They would draw on film, as if around a greenhouse, and would work inside that. The paradox is, the factory was amidst performing an important state order at the moment. The Euro's workers averted a default on obligations even in that extreme situation. In the meantime, the air temperature sank to minus 25 degrees Celsius inside the workshops. And why did the workers continue doing the jobs? A working man, especially in the Euro's, has a distinctive desire to live up to expectations. But despite the general havoc, people would still come to work because they had grown accustomed to doing something. They could not imagine their life without it. An age-old habit of surviving in a community has been handed down from generation to generation. The factory is a system uniting everyone, a pivot which different destinies are drawn on. As it often happened in Russia's history, the times of harsh trials would unexpectedly bring up the people who would open the ball and steer others. They had been somewhere nearby before, but when troubles came, they would assume leadership. Different names were applied to them – leaders, heroes, chieftains. But it's not the names that mattered. They always enjoyed people's trust. The Demidovs played that role in the times of Tsar Peter I, when Russia was conducting the northern war against Sweden. Designer-in-chief Alexander Morozov, a creator of the legendary T-34 tank, was the leader of this kind for Ural Zavod workers during the horrifying battles of World War II. And in the 1990s, the workers put their trust in Vladimir Potkin. Vladimir Potkin was appointed designer-in-chief at the harshest moment in the history of Ural Zavod. Many thought then the factory's days were numbered. 
Against the background of a general collapse, the survey and looting, a tough, dedicated and, I'd say, model person took helm at the design bureau. He epitomized decency. He was a designer by God's will, but as a person he was tough and never made overtures to anyone. He had a stony stare and was not amiable, yet he emanated intellect. His vocabulary was not for the fans of Bel Leto. He uttered rule, harsh words, but he was their master. You see, he was a rare type of man. He was entered in commendation lists many a time, but he always crossed himself out. On the contrary, he would enter others there instead. He never promoted himself anywhere. Vladimir Potkin was trained as a tankman. He graduated from the Armored Troops University. He came to Ural Zavod in 1971. The factory became a second home for him over 20 years of work. But now this factory was dying, while well, various meetings and conferences were seething with passion. There was noise and shouting at the conferences. Bigger wages. Let's make civilian products if the military don't pay. Let's turn out knives, saucepans, anything at all. At one of these conferences, amid the shouting and shrilling, Potkin rose from his place gave his stony stare to everyone and said, well, why don't you look for a new designer-in-chief? And he went out. I was moderating that conference and I remember a sudden feeling of void. He went out and the uproar died down. Everyone was standing and gazing around. Something dawned on people. We won't have what to do. We won't have money at home. And we somehow managed to divorce our factory from politicking rapidly enough, like the church is divorced from the state. Politics remained beyond the fence. People realized they would survive only if they rescued their factory. The situation was like at the front line. And actions of the front line type were needed, brisk, tough and resolute. If the centralized management of the industry is dysfunctional, someone has to assume that function. A council of designers in chief was set up and Potkin became its chairman. The council was able to keep up the intra-corporate relationships. It supported primarily the vital plants, like the artillery makers, because there is no building tanks without them. Redundancies swept the industries and engineers were the first to be fired because they did not turn out sellable items. But the management of Ural Zavod did not slash workforce at any engineering departments. He prevented the design bureau from falling apart. He did his best to create prospects for the people so they wouldn't leave. Designers are custom-made experts, and replacing them is highly problematic. Potkin really knew the genuine price of this labor staff. The task was to preserve the core of designers, the brain of the bureau, and it was feasible only by working for the future. The purchase of machine tools continued in small amounts. Then the digital technologies for plotting. Others were pointing at us, you blockheads, what are you doing? And yet Plotkin spent money on this and said, we won't survive or catch up with others without it. By saving people, he was saving the plant's new product, the T-90 tank. Potkin knew about the expansive capabilities of that combat vehicle. The army accepted the tank for service in 1991. The T-90 was designed so suitable and aptly that it still has considerable modernization resource. We are improving it all the time. If we get a new siding unit, we put it in there. A new running gear, also there. 
or a new armor plating, also there. The T90 has imbued all the best ideas. The T-90 tank became a new generation combat vehicle. It had much better performance than all the previous families of Soviet and foreign tanks in terms of firepower, maneuverability and degree of protection. Prospective customers even called it a flying tank. When this vehicle jumps off the ramp, it lands on all the rollers, which means it has ideal aligning. It continues movement without any problems after the jump. Ural's tanks have always been known for their perfect running gear, which is undergoing permanent improvements. While the unknown spectators view the T-90 jump from the ramp as just an effectual trick, a specialist views it as an assessment of the tank's reliability. I myself took part in this harsh testing and was amazed by this running gear, which withstood shocks so perfectly. The T-90 flying tank would invariably evoke amusement and jealousy among competitors. Some one of them made an attempt once to repeat the jump on their own tank. Yeah. I asked the designer then, did you do anything about your landing gear? Yeah. No, he answered. I did not ask any more questions. The tank made just a single jump from the ramp and the driver had to be rushed to hospital with a backbone trauma. That's how it is. The military found the tank to be amazing and promising. About 250 vehicles of this family had been built by the mid-1990s, but the government soon ran out of money for purchasing them. The situation in the 1990s was such that Russia might simply lose the title of a great tank power. And this would have surely happened, but the Demidov's principle came into play. Rely on yourself, your own strength, your technologies, your experience, as well as your resources, personnel and people. Worm your way out of it because no one will help, especially in the defense industry. One could often hear in those years that tanks were not a priority thing to think about. Feed the people first, they said. Yet the designer-in-chief of Ural Wagon Zavod was unyielding. The country needed a tank of its own. Potkin realized only too well that too many destinies hinged on the rate of utilization of the factory's capacity. The factory needed an order and India was first in line. Indian officials came to us and said, well guys, come to us and sign an agreement. And the three of them, Sergei Maev, the chief of the main department for armored troops, Nikolai Malich, the factory's director, and Vladimir Potkin, went to India at the end of 1998. And when we came there, the Indians refused to buy standard version tanks. They didn't say it right away. They simply stopped listening to the Russian side. Potkin, Potkin did explanations the first time and then a second time, but to no avail. Then he saw clearly the Indians needed something different. They demanded a heat imaging site, something we didn't have at the time. Also they demanded some other things, which we yet had to develop. The negotiations were going downhill, but there was no returning home without a contract. This would mean a death sentence for the plant. What to do? The designer-in-chief was to take a decision. And then he took a really desperate decision. Let's offer them a 1,000 horsepower engine. Frankly, it was half-baked then. New siding units, access hitches, and so on and so forth. He offered an upgrade of the T-90 tank. And the Indians said, OK, we need a tank like this. Please come in six months' time and take three tanks along with you. We'll watch the trials. This was a good tank. It had fair parameters, I mean. But it still existed in the development phase only. Botkin's decision was very risky. But he did not see any other option. 
The things that are bluntly transferred from paper onto metal never work. You always have to do readjustments and to find out what's wrong. Frankly speaking, this takes time, years actually. Who would be held responsible if the trials flopped? The designer in chief, of course. Just him, neither a minister nor a president. Those six months were nightmarish. Just imagine you're getting a crucial assembly part. The machinists botched it and it's good for nothing. But it has a three months long manufacture cycle. Three months have elapsed and only another three are left. And if you install the botched element, it will fail at the testing. A look at Potkin would make your heart throb. The whole city was awaiting that contract. It had become proverbial. A gear rolling tests began at the factory's testing range in the spring of 1999. Tensions were growing from one day to another. Everyone at the factory and Vladimir Potkin in the first place were on the brink. He did not feel well. Doctors told him to stay away from going to India. He had health problems. Of course, the designer in chief took everything so close to heart. He treasured state interests. He really placed his homeland above anything else. Testing at the factory was over on May 11th. The tanks were ready for shipment to India. One day, when the tanks are ready for shipment, Potkin fell from his chair to the floor, unable to put pills into his mouth. This was discovered by his secretary. She said later, I remembered he was there, but no answer. Then I went in and saw him lie on the floor. Alas, it was too late. On May 13, 1999, Vladimir Potkin died. His heart failed him. The Indians were so shocked that they told us, let's name this tank Vladimir. They had the designer in chief in mind. On the day the jets carrying tanks left for India, Ural Vagun Zavod was bidding farewell to the designer in chief. He died like a soldier in battle, and these are not empty words. He died like a soldier shutting the firing slit of the enemy bunker with his body and thus saving his comrades. Potkin was posthumously awarded the Order of Services to the Fatherland, Grade 3, for development of the T-90 tank. Someone obviously decided this was enough, and his role in rescuing Ural Vagon Zavod remained underestimated. It won't be an overstatement to say that Vladimir Potkin gave his life for this factory and for the city that had become his own. This was how the rank-and-file people viewed his death. Only a man like him was able to keep all of this together, to keep up this tank, to keep the factory going, and to keep the entire Russian tank industry alive. This is the only footage where we can see the designer-in-chief of the Uralian tanks made at Ural Vagon Zavod, Vladimir Potkin. When you speak to historians of mining and industries in the Urals, they always call your attention to the special character of workers there. Its origins are found in the times of the Demidovs. For a local worker, the factory is always his factory. The workers support and hail everything that's done for the factory's benefit. Not a single Uralian worker would ever agree to view the factory as something alien to him and his family. He always remembers that his grandfathers and great-great-grandfathers had come to the Taiga to build the factory. That's why he deems these bonds to be unbreakable. The naughtiest trials of tanks in India were still ahead. Everyone who was supposed to go there realized the hugeness of their personal responsibility for the factory's future and hence the future of their near and dear. 
the Indians worked hard to create the most extreme conditions for the testing. As a testing range, they chose the Tar Desert. May and June are the hottest months of the year. We got there in May. The heat was about plus 50. If you touch the almost red-hot armor plating, you got a burn. One of our guys and I got a heat stroke. I saw for the first time what it looks like when a man is literally crooked. This is a product of water shortage, of body dehydration. How did the tank drivers feel inside the red-hot tank? At times they were literally sitting in a pool of sweat. Sweat all over, down to socks. You take off the shoes and it's like water there. We lost a lot of weight. I lost 7 to 8 kilos. The dust was annoying no less than the heat wave. It seemed to be just everywhere. While on the road, the tanks were barely seen in swarms of dust. We were plowing through the sand that almost reached the underbelly. Well, the tank was moving on. Then we climbed a tall dune. It's like climbing a five-story house. Those dunes were in fact like mountains. First we descended and then we had to climb them. Once I got stuck on the sandy slope of a safe dune. My engine was short of power. The Indian said, well, you failed. Requirements towards negotiating the obstacles were the toughest. You gotta fail in case of a halt. One more mishap and the tank dropped out of the trials. And this might break the contract. We had the reverse gear and it had a smaller reduction factor than the first gear. I turned around and got over the dune on reserve gear. The Indian said, well, that's your know-how. Okay, accept it. We fired at long distances and had a 100% kill of the targets. Then the Indian military said they needed a heat imaging site. Well, it was developed and installed on this tank. We were asked to show the replacements of the engine out in the field with the aid of a recovery vehicle. This was kind of a maintainability test. Under the scorching sun, in a dusty desert, a too strong crew managed to replace the engine within a mere eight hours. If you have a highly qualified crew, which is knowledgeable and skilled, replacing the engine out in the field is not a problem. Our vehicles are sledgehammer proof, extremely reliable. They are fully repairable in the field environment. It's as reliable and simple as the Kalashnikov rifle. The designers obviously wanted it to be maintainable a field, so that no one would need any top-notch repair base, just some equipment, some adjusting. The crew should be able to do everything on its own. The Indians kept inventing ever more new tests. We were saying OK to everything, to refueling from the installations they named, to the tanks moving around the clock, and so on. Just imagine, each tank had ended up with 2,000 operation kilometers. Task crews from Nizhny Tagil coped with all the naughtiest tasks. The tanks did a splendid performance. The Indian military were amazed by what they'd seen and gave the highest mark to the tests. However, they were in no hurry to sign a contract. The Indians did not have any claims against the T-90. They had tested it in 1999 and they liked it. But did they doubt the viability of the factory? A tank is bought to serve the whole life cycle of 25 years. And someone should upgrade, improve or simply maintain it during the period. But will Ural Vagon Zavod exist in 20 years' time? In 2000, Vladimir Putin, then the Prime Minister, gave his personal guarantees to the Indians that the plant would be alive. And the contract took off the ground. 
Почему здесь ура голосовали за... Why did workers voted for Putin here? Вовсе не потому, что заводчанки... No one gave any orders to them. Просто здесь отлично... Very simply, they knew it was Putin's interference that breathed life into the Indian contract. A contract on supplies of 310 tanks of the T-90 family to India was signed on February 5, 2001. It threw a lifeline to the factory. Brigadier General Singh, India's military attaché in Moscow, said this tank could be duly called a deterrence factor number two after the nukes in terms of efficiency. Recovery of the factory began as of that moment. Workshops resumed operations. And it was not only our factory, it was all the suppliers. The factories that were outsourced for supplying parts for the T-90s as tank also called back their workers and revived manufacturing. Algeria, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan and Uganda followed India and purchased the tanks. The T-90 topped the sales among the world's main battle tank at the beginning of the 21st century. The Uralvagon Zavod started working at full capacity. The Indian contract saved this factory and the entire tank industry in Russia. This industry was restored practically from scratch, and now its drive engine is gaining speed. Design bureaus and production facilities have started working efficiently enough, and we can now set more ambitious production targets for ourselves. Historians say the Urals has seen several phases of industrialization. The first one began in the times of Tsar Peter I, when the Demidovs came to this area upon his will. The second phase fell on the years before and during World War II. Time has come for a third wave of industrialization now. These tests bring out the true spirit of the Urals. This is firmness of the spirit, resolve for action, an unconventional thinking or creative mentality, if you use today's terms. Some people in some places take pride in creativity, but here it's a fixture. The setting up of Ural Vagon Zavod Corporation was one of the elements of the third industrialization. In 2007, all the research institutes and enterprises engaged in construction of tanks were brought under one umbrella. The objective was to preserve tank engineering in this country. If this had not happened, I don't even know what we would have had now. Nizhny Tagil is the foundation of Russian tank engineering and probably the center of the world tank industry. A unique situation is emerging now. As the state gives an opportunity to enterprises to move over to a new level with reliance on budget funds. The setting up of the corporation gave a new lease of life to hundreds of plants all across Russia. A new phase of industrialization began there too. I'd like to hope this is the beginning, the beginning of technological overhauls on the basis of novel technologies. In the first place, we pin hopes on mechanical engineering that will give a push to steel smelting and the allied manufacturers working with the companies like Ural Wagon Zavod. We unite 360 enterprises all across Russia and all of them will naturally undergo changes. The way they will be developing will also predestine our future. For instance, speedy modernization began at plant number 9 in Yekaterinburg. Young workers, savant and computers began to come to the enterprise after new machine tools had appeared in the workshops. Someone is asking for a sketch. I can create a program for it test it, select tools and options, all of that on my own. In other words, I can do it from a drawing. This is the only enterprise in Russia today that designs tank guns. 
now plant number 9 has turned into a subsidiary of the huge corporation named Ural Vagon Zavod. And when we got together, we formed a united team. And it's really important to fill the shoulder of your true friend by your side. We have the same tasks today, and we're resolving them. The famous Russian scientist and metallurgist Vladimir Grum Gurjimaila, who worked for many years at the Nizhny Tagil plants, said in 1920 that the defense plants should turn into centers of research. The intellect of the whole steel smelting industry should be concentrated in them. Like any innovative technologies, modern heavy armor technologies give a powerful boost to the tank industry and to the mechanical engineering sector on the whole. Defense industry is the basis of everything, I think, because it has a fair designing potential. It's the sector where top-notch technologies are designed and implemented. That's why the defense industry can become a drive engine of the entire manufacturing sector. The technologies that shifted from defense industries to civilian manufacturing raised the general level of mechanical engineering. This is our country's prestige. Our defense manufacturing has always been in advance guard. Our young people take pride in working at Ural Vagon Zavod. For people living in Nizhny Tagil, the remote sounds of firing tanks are as customary as hooding cars. But if they don't hear the sounds of firing tanks, this means there are grounds for concern. Firing from tank guns means the factory is working and life is all right. Russian defense industry workers are again feeling society's respect for them. They are a creative class of Russian society. Prestige is returning to the professions of engineer, designer, technologist, worker and generally blue-collar worker. This is extremely important. And the results of the work of the defense industry will go beyond the stability of supplies of all the things needed by the army and the navy. They will influence Russia's new industrialization.